so much time. We just discovered that we are going until noon, which means a little over an hour. So I would like to get moving as quickly as possible uh, and cover as much as possible. Um, I don't have to say good morning. It's already done. That's true. It's done. Okay, so let's go. All right. Do you? But you see, I like to start wor workshops by saying good morning in at least several languages. Um, well, the, we can get Korean and Japanese from her, um, but I can do it. The German, Guten Morgen. Another one. Uh, merci. Good. I know you can. That's why I started it. You want it? Anyway, um, this is essentially a uh, exercise in the spontaneous paradox. Um, and we, they ask, how, when did they ask it? About a year ago for the title for a workshop and what you were going to do. And uh, I, I knew a year ago. And then uh, this morning, Insu and I decided we would do both this one and this afternoon's together. And so it's not altogether clear what we are going to spontaneously do. Um, I guess that one, I just want to make one comment on the previous section, uh, which applies here as well. And um, I'm glad that I do not believe understanding is possible. There is only more or less useful misunderstanding. And um, yeah, you know, this is difficult with this kind of a room, but uh, I'd like to have this be a workshop for you. Uh, I mean, I can listen to Insu, and Insu can listen to me, and that's relatively easy. We can talk to each other. Um, but I, so I, what I would ask you to do is, you know, feel free to ask questions um, and do so loudly so we don't have to repeat them. Um, but, you know, because your questions are the only way that I can know that you are misunderstanding us in some useful fashion. <laughs> oh, yes, that, that's rule number two you just followed. Anytime you think I say something that might be a joke, you must laugh. <laughs> oh, I see a question here. Okay. Okay. A real brief outline to your first session outline when you see a client, because I know that changes all the time with your new thinking. Okay, that's relatively easy to do. Okay. Uh, I think that... Uh, by the way, don't feel pressured about the time. Although we are stopping at at one o'clock, at twelve o'clock, we have another hour and a half after after we're known. So we will go on. Uh, we sort of stop where we where we stop, and then we'll pick up where we uh, pick up. Okay. The question had to do with uh, outline for the first session. I think that Steve's uh, first session and my first session are very different. Uh, for obvious reasons, because we are very different two people, and uh, as Thanks. you know, we value the differences between the two of us. We think it's wonderful that we are different. And we uh, think it's wonderful that John Weakland and Dick Fish do it differently than we do it. Right. Uh, we don't see that as a problem. Like we're something. not at war, never uh, have been. Uh, the, my first session uh, is, I start out with, what do you suppose needs to happen here so that you don't have to come back to see me anymore? So right, my first question is the termination criteria. And uh, uh, oftentimes it has an uh, impact uh, with setting the client to look to the future. And so I never ask what brought you here, because then they start telling you about what brought them here. I'm, I want to know what the termination criteria is. Or the other way to ask those questions are, what do you suppose needs to happen here so that you can say, 
this was a time well spent for you. This was a useful time for you. That's another way you could get the clients to look to the future and uh, describe the future. And then, even then, that's not enough. A lot of clients will come back and say, to start to talk a lot about why they are here, and they have to justify being here. Uh, and I think they, we need to allow some room for that. And then I'm again coming back to what you suppose needs to happen so that you can say this was a time well spent, this was money well spent, or whatever, whatever. Uh, and spending some time with that before I move on to the miracle question. It has a sort of repetition. It has an impact of repeating themselves. And I'm a great believer in repeating the same story. I think the more we repeat the story, the more real it becomes in the client's mind. As long as it's a good story we're repeating. Right. And we don't want the client to repeat the, the, the pathology story, but more solution story. Uh, and I think that the more they repeat the, the solution talk, the problem talk disappears. Uh, I, I tend to do that and then go on to the miracle question. Those of you, anybody who are not familiar with the miracle question? Okay. All right. Uh, there are some who are not familiar with the miracle question. Let me just sort of repeat that, okay? There are, we have found there are certain ways to ask a miracle question that seem to be very productive. It's not just reading the script. Yeah. Um, the way it goes like this. Suppose. Suppose is the very important question. I think that supposing allows the clients the freedom to uh, go wild, sort of go off. Uh, and uh, so start with... Uh, well, before I said, sometimes, depending on the client, uh, depending on how uptight they are, how frightened they are, uh, I might start out with, we usually start out with, I'm going to ask you a very strange question. <laughs> and when you preface it that way, you can get away with almost anything. And you need to have a pause at that point. I'm going to ask you a very strange question. And pause. They can imagine whatever strange question it is. It's probably even stranger than what you end up asking. <laughs> so then start with suppose, and then pause. Suppose. And they start to lean forward. And uh, the other thing that I like to add is sort of like a little bit of a, um, the, the technique from hypnosis. Suppose after you and I talk, you go home and you do whatever you do the rest of the day. And you go to bed tonight. And you go to sleep. Pause. And pause. Pause. <laughs> right? The value of a silence we cannot emphasize enough. Fast talking doesn't mean you're going to get brief therapy. If anything, <laughs> <laughs> the faster you talk, the longer it goes. Okay. Uh, and while you were sleeping, the house is very quiet. Everybody in the household is sleeping. And while you were sleeping, a miracle happens. Pause. <laughs> <laughs> and. That's the crucial piece, okay? And the problem that brought you here today is gone, solved, pause. And then they start to think about this. This should be a longer pause. Okay. Uh, and uh, then you can see the client start to imagine something. Something. Who knows what they're imagining? But you can see their eyes are going up on the ceiling, and they start to look up, and they start to imagine things, and they start to smile, and they sit up straight, and Sometimes. all these things happen. Okay. And uh, the next, the part is a crucial piece, and this is where we have to be very, very, very detailed about the solution picture. I think the common mistake is clients come up with, ah. Oh, I will no longer have a drinking problem. I will no longer be depressed. That's of too course. Big. That's a perfectly reasonable thing to say. Too big. 
So you need to bring that back down to, so you're just waking out of your sleep. You're just coming out of your sleep. What would be the first thing you'll notice? And they would say, well, I would feel like I had a good night's rest. Okay. Yeah. And you stay with that, stay with that. And then, so, so, all right. So when you f wake up feeling like you had a good night's rest, what will you notice different about your surroundings? So go with the small pieces, small pieces, small pieces, small pieces. And how will your wife know that this miracle has happened to you overnight? You can't tell her, obviously, because you don't know. Because you were sleeping when it happened. Uh, I think that... How will your wife know? Uh, the hallmark of this... Uh, the brief therapy is this relationship, the interactional component, okay? That we always are looking at clients from the interactional point of view. And so this relationship question is very, very important. And what mm -hmm. we call the relationship question is my perception of your perception of me, how I see you seeing me, and it's continuously introduced. The whole notion of that is repeatedly introduced. Over and over. And so the guy will say, hey, you ask him how his wife will know, and he says, well, I'll smile at her. Or she'll smile at me. That's the most frequent answer, by the way. That's included in almost every response to the miracle question is to wake up in the morning and somebody will smile. Most I, my impression is most households must be rather glum places in the morning. <laughs> and this is cross-cultural, I must add. I don't care whether it's Korea or uh, Spain or Finland, you get the same answer. Finland, yeah. Yeah. yeah, same answer. And so you start to build on, so suppose your wife, so suppose you notice your husband smiling at you. What will you do then that you didn't do this morning? Okay, okay already we're talking about something different. I'll smile back. Tomorrow morning. What she smiles at me, I'll smile back. Okay, what will you do that you didn't do this morning then? I'll smile, at, I'll smile back at her. So when you smile back at her, what will your husband do that he didn't do this morning? He will reach out and touch me. Okay. He'll say again, good morning, darling. Again, so it's a small pause. So clients can start to almost see their pictures developing about tomorrow morning. That's the kind of impact it has. Okay? And uh, I guess I want to emphasize something at this point about this, the pauses um, and silence. Um, Westerners have a di great difficulty, and Americans probably more than Europeans on this, um, is uh, in a conversation, Americans, a long silence. You think about this for a minute. How long is a long silence in a conversation? Well, the research tells us it's around three seconds. At three seconds or so, what Americans start to get nervous. Right. And um, I've been look, watch, looking at and timing some of our tapes and the silences, and uh, you know, we frequently are able to stretch them out to five seconds or six. Ten. Oh, if you, yeah, ten, even 10 or 15 sometimes. Uh, you know, most therapists I watch tend to talk too much. And so you ask this miracle question, and the, the first answer you're going to get from the greatest majority of clients is a spontaneous, I don't know. Right? Those of you who've tried it must have gotten that. Mm -hmm. And then what happens is therapists start to re-ask the question in a different form. Or change the topic. Or change topics. You say, this is not working. This is not working. Don't give up that soon. What I do when a client says, I don't know, if I do anything at all, it's sit there. 
and sit there. And then pretty soon, and then, you know, five or six seconds later, the client will start to say things like, oh, I will certainly feel better, and away you go. But therapy, the conversation is a matter of turn taking. It's just like, hi, how are you? And you say, I'm fine. And we all, right? It's always that same kind of thing. And so we ask the question, and they give you an I don't know answer. And if you don't respond, that leaves the rest of the answer to come yet. The uh, people in the field of uh, discourse analysis call it the uh, adjacency pair. And that is that in normal conversation, in daily, everyday conversation, uh, that we take turns. And there are some unspoken rules about who can change the topic. And it's a pretty much generally, pretty democratic. It's pretty much shared. Uh, both parties in a conversation have a right to change topics. And also, so we, what we are doing is we're taking advantage of this is how people function. This is how people talk to each other. So when you refuse to uh, their, I mean, respond to their silence was another question. The ball is still in his or her court. Okay? It's and still so they his have or to, her turn. It's still his or her turn when you refuse to respond to that. By the way, if you look at the uh, attorneys in courtroom, they are masters at using this to put pressure on, the, on the, the witnesses to come up with right answers. And all you have to do is just ignore. When they say, I don't know, just don't say anything. And the, the, the pressure is still there, so they have to come up and say something. Uh, the, the police are very good at this kind of te techniques. But it's also a normal thing you'll see if you observe conversations in, in, in the pub. You see the same kind of operations going on. People talk in adjacency pairs, and if one guy is silent, the other one keeps talking. Right? Isn't that a normal thing that happens? So we're just doing deliberately things we normally do spontaneously. The other thing also seems to be happening is that once clients have said, I don't know, and there seems to free them up, and you sort of don't respond to that, they just say, I don't know, and then they start thinking about well, I suppose I will do this, and I will do that. And that's a kind of a very common response we get from the clients. So the first answer, I don't know, don't, uh, don't accept that. Of course they don't know. Of course they ha This is such a strange idea we are introducing to them. Uh, they can, was full of a chronology uh, sort of, a, of the problem description. And uh, they have, uh, some clients have, uh, you can almost tell, they have uh, neatly organized what kind of story they're going to tell you. And we are interrupting them. So, of course, they don't know. Okay? And one of the major differences between us and uh, some other people in our way of working is if you look at the normal sequence of events in a story, the solution is, and the resolution is at the end of the story. We ask for it at the beginning. It's a very different way of having story told. Yeah, um, when doing therapy, especially with uh, teenagers who may be very reluctant to talk and they'll say answers like nothing or I don't know, mm -hmm. uh, what I found useful for me sometimes if I wanted to do something other than pause um, is to say, that's fine. Uh, besides, I don't know, what else would you? Yeah. <laughs> or besides nothing, yeah. in addition to nothing, what else would you do? That's right. That's right. <laughs> yep. That's right. I will sometimes, with them adolescents might say, well, pretend you did know. That works sometimes, too. Or suppose you do know, mm. and that's another way, good way to bypass that. Or move it into the social frame. How would your best friend know? Then you might get an answer. Yeah, okay. I'm just curious about how this uh, question got into the public. Miracle question. Miracle question. Actually, uh, I can tell you how that happened. Yeah. Over 10 years ago. We can remember a case. 12 years ago. 12 years ago. Yeah. We can remember a case that got us started on this. And In when March. I tell you this, I know you're going to say, my client said that too. Uh, my client said that this, I'm sure, before 12 years ago. Uh, except that I didn't hear it. Except 12 we, years ago. We were watching okay? this day. <laughs> and we were, we were, I was 
talking to a lady who comes in, and she had a horrible life story. Her kids were wild, her husband was an alcoholic, she was depressed, and she was, you know, I mean, just horrible. I mean, many, many of your cases. So I started usual. What do you suppose needs to happen so that you can say, I don't need to come back to see Insu anymore? And this lady sighs, heaves a big sigh, and says, you know, only thing that will help me is a miracle. I know your client said that to you. I know my client said that before, I mean, to me, before 12 years ago. I didn't know what else to say, so I said, all right, suppose, miracle happened. That's how we got started. And she started to answer in an amazingly concrete, specific form. And then a couple of days later, I had one of my vague specialties, uh, this client who I didn't understand at all. And uh, so I, said, I remembered this case, Vince's, yeah. And so I said, okay, so suppose there was a miracle overnight. And the woman came up with concrete, specific answers. And we were, happened to be watching it, this process, and so we started right from that session on, every first session for the last 12 years. You never get the same answer. Okay, the question had to do with, to go back to your question, what the, what's the, the, the procedure for the first session? Uh, after you have a detailed description of the, solu uh, of the solution picture, Clients, some clients will say solution feelings. Okay, some clients will talk a lot about their feelings, and so they will say this is solution feelings, uh, or miracle feelings. Then uh, the next easiest thing you could do after that is ask the uh, exceptions. Tell me about most recent times yeah, well. when you have had little bit of these. Miracle pictures, miracles. Yeah. We are starting to not call them exceptions. Um, the group we just finished in, uh, proposed that we start to call them hidden miracles. We just changed this last week. <laughs> <laughs> so when has this happened? Little pieces of this miracle. When was the most recent time you felt you weren't depressed, for instance? Or, if you got, went the other way, when was the most recent time you, you got up in the morning and your wife smiled at you? They stopped and That will get a long pause, usually, that question, on their side. You've got to sit there and wait. But the, you, they'll come up with it. Again, the question, uh, the asking, I think that its clients are incredibly uh, responsive to the questions we ask. If you ask, have you had small pieces of this miracle happened recently, they would tend to say no. But when you ask, when was the most recent time? Then they tend to tell you. Then, tell, then they will look for it. Okay? So, again, the phrasing of the question is crucial. It's terribly important. Because they are, clients do try to cooperate with us. Uh, yeah, and you want as many details as possible about these things. As richly described as you can get this piece of the hidden miracle. Because the more they talk about it, the more real it is. Hmm? And so we want to tease out as many details. Okay, we, your wife smiled at you on Wednesday of last week when you did what? what? What else was different about Wednesday of last week? Or Tuesday night, perhaps. And, you know, how... how what was the dog doing? I had one recently, and the uh, guy answered the miracle question, and um, he said, well, his, his wife probably wouldn't notice because she lives in an entirely different part of the house. The kid go, is off, is gone, the, you know, he's uh, off summer, to school somewhere. Oh, oh summer camp or something. Summer camp yeah. or something. And um, he said, yeah, they, well, actually, you know, it would be the, the dog who sees me more often than anybody else in the house. <laughs> So we said, yeah, how, well, how would the dog know if the dog could tell us? And he started to talk to him about how the dog would know if the dog could tell us. It was quite clear. 
I have to say that I personally experienced the, the power of this question about a month and a half ago. I was down at Disney uh, with my family, and I'm terrified of roller coasters. And I asked myself, what am I doing taking my family to a place where there's all kinds of thrill rides? Anything that goes down quickly scares me to death. And it has a long history, but we're not into psychics, so we won't go into that. Uh, and I, was, I took with me to the trip... Uh, treating the problem drinker ah, okay. <laughs> and read two-thirds of the book okay. finished it while waiting for my family all female to use the bathroom anyway <laughs> I, I then used the question with myself and I, I can only tell you the enormous relief I was so happy when I imagined for myself what it would be like and after reading the book, you know, very much in detail, how my, I could see my, I was answering these questions to myself, right. I would see my, my family smiling at me, being happy that I could join them on the roller coasters and so forth, I could see it all, and it was like I found the solution. I went to the park, I went on every thrill ride, on the most dangerous ones wow. to my mind, wow. and I, my family was so flabbergasted they couldn't believe it. I can't believe it, but I actually enjoyed it because that was part of the miracle. I would enjoy yeah. doing it. Yeah. Um, so I can only tell you that as one of the many thousands for whom it's worked, but without a therapist in front of me, it really worked. It does, it does. <laughs> so I'm very turned on to this. This is another part of our model. When somebody gives you a story like that, just shake hands, don't have to say a word. So when why, say, have, why talk so much? Okay, when you hear a story like this, then I need to say then, what do you need to do to do more of it? Okay, so this is mm, the way yeah. to do more. Come and on. I would want to find out more about this family's reaction in some details. And how he reacted to the family's reaction. Okay, so your daughters were, you know, smiling at you and giggling and doing all the things little girls do. And what did you do in response to that? And then what? And then what? And then what? I uh, want to get as many details as possible so that we have what, from that and perhaps the beginnings of whatever the homework assignment might be if we choose to give one. So when they say, what do you need to do to do more of it is, repeat the, the miracle picture, then I think that the homework assignment is, since do, this has worked for you, go home do and do more. And come back, come back and tell us what difference this made for you. Okay? We are interested in the difference that this is going to make. Not that they did it. We don't care if they did it or not. We are more interested in what difference is this is going to make in their life. Okay, so that's the pretty much of the your first, version. Yeah, okay. First, okay. What is your version? Okay. <laughs> now my version of answering right. your question. Yeah, we need to take it all off here. Let's get rid of the whole thing. Um, And my version is slightly different. Um, in some, perhaps because it's more generalized. Um, but as I see it, the first session is organized around this question. What does the client want? I remember uh, John Wakeland telling me that um, uh, Milton Erickson once defined therapy in this way. as two people sitting in the room talking together, trying to figure out what the hell one of them wants. <laughs> um, he attributed that to uh, Erickson, um, but I think it's only in the sense that uh, John as ventriloquist. Um, yeah, and what does the client want? Well, the miracle question is certainly the easiest way I have found to gener begin to generate this kind of, of uh, information. Uh, 
or whatever. Um, and then has the next part is what can the client do? Particularly, what can the client do about what it is they want? You know, if the client is talking about wanting his voices to be silent, and he's never had that experience. Okay, well, we don't know if he can do it. Uh, but if he has had the experience where his voices are silent, and usually have, they have had that experience, then at some level they know how to make them silent. And so they can do it. So you can give them a task calling for silent voices. And what can the client do? Or, and or, what needs to happen? What needs to happen, particularly what needs to happen so the client can get what he wants? As I say, it's a little bit more general than Insu's version. Uh, you don't need the miracle question. It's not necessary in some sense. Uh, it seems to be the, one of the most useful ways of getting answers to this question about what does the client want, but it's not the only way. And. Uh, But once you find out what the client wants, and then go into about what can the client do. You know, if the client wants to uh, stop drinking, well, okay. When's the most recent time when you weren't drinking? And start there. Um, that's the basic, my basic outline for the first session. Or maybe all sessions, perhaps. Can you can you comment a little bit on uh, how you would direct this if the if what the client wants is all in terms of what they think other people need to do and need to change as opposed to they want to change something about their own behavior? I think it's perfectly unreasonable for us as therapists uh, to have this. I think it's a crazy idea, you know, that the client's going to come in and talk about them wanting themselves to change. Um, I think the, statistically, at least, the initial answer is somebody else will change. That's the way most clients present things. Hmm? Right? You know, I know in my house it's true. If we have any problems, it's her fault. <laughs> now, you ask her, and she's going to tell you it's my fault. Hmm? And I think she should change, and she thinks I should change. And that's, I think, you know, that's the way it is. Oh, the thousands of clients we've had over the years. Um, that's the way I think things are normal. They want somebody else to change. Okay. So having so, said that, what to do about it? <laughs> the miracle question is, my husband will stop drinking, for example. Uh, or he will be in bed. When I wake up, he will be in bed. Unlike, I don't know where he is, or something like that. Or, or some client said, he will learn to keep his penis in his pants or something like that. We get clients you know what the problem like is, right? You don't have to know. You don't have to ask about it. Anyway, so suppose he does. Suppose he does. Again, here comes the suppose question, okay? Suppose he does. What would he say how you would be different? That's the one way of going, you know, I mean, asking about that's less confrontive or less direct way to go about it, what would he say how you would be, what you will do different tomorrow morning? Uh, the other way is, so suppose he does, whatever, uh, what will you do different that you didn't do this morning? Um, so it's a you know, couple different ways that you could get at that. Uh, some clients who are really focused on the other person, especially parents who bring in their impossible kids and I want you to fix this impossible kid. Again, you can still go at that. When they are so focused on that, if you say, what will you do different? They will say, you are crazy. I didn't come, I'm a perfect parent. There's nothing wrong with my parenting, it's the kid. When you have that kind of a case and you want to say then, so suppose okay. he goes, gets up in the morning, gets himself ready, you know, hang up his towel and get to school on time. What do you suppose how he will see you being different? 
what would you say how you would be different? Well, uh, he will say, I won't be screaming at him. That's how they start. Okay, so you can, again, start weaving back and forth about the solutions. You know, some small piece. Okay, you know, so she will stop drinking. Okay, and how will you know that? What would she do to let it you know? It would tell you that she stopped drinking? Oh, she'll get up in the morning and um, won't have a hangover. Okay, so how will you know she doesn't have a hangover? Get some description of that. Okay, and once you see that, how will you respond? What would you do differently? And how will that go from there? What's the next step? How will his stopping drinking affect things? The rest of the family is doing, and so on and so on. Uh, we we'll try and build up then the entire picture around his having changed what it is she wanted him to change. And then it becomes reasonable for people to experiment then with doing some of these things, even though he hasn't changed yet. I mean, and you don't have to tell them that. They'll figure that out. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. So it's, it's very interactional in that way. Yeah. We're, we are looking at the interactional process of what goes on between two people. And mm. once you change one loop in that, right? Well, one piece of it. One yeah. piece of it changes the whole thing, right? Mm -hmm. and yeah, you, you know, we want a behavioral description if you can get it. Don't, can't always get it. Um, then you do something else, but we'll get to that too, I'm sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. We're still coming sure. to this. What does a client want? Start with that, right? What does a client want? Usually it will tell you, I want all these people off my back, right? <laughs> and so then what, does, what, would the, what would the school need to see you do to leave you alone? What need the court need to see you do? What need your parents, parents need to see you do? All that stuff. So start mm -hmm. with that. So it's uh, essentially with the same, uh, same right. outline. So what, uh, what, you know, how, how can you get these people off your back? Yeah, well, of course, yeah. it's, and I would say, sure, yeah, well, I'm, you know, you really got yourself in a bind now, you know, you know because they don't believe you. So how are you going to get them off your back? And I would just sympathize. Yeah, yeah, it's really the shits. Yeah, you got you, you got into this thing even though you didn't do it. They're still on your back just like you did. So what are you going to do? To leave for the purpose of having people H having the uh, pro uh, probation you officer off your back. Yeah. Leave you alone. Right. Yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah, at some point, probably. Sure. Usually they'll figure it out so you don't have to assign it. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Usually they figure that out by themselves. You know, I don't know about other people, but I find my clients are terribly clever. They'll figure it out. Yeah. Okay. Therapist bias about what? Yeah. About what? About what? I have lots of biases. Have a, yeah. About what? Huh? Yeah. 
Well, no, that's, it's I'm illegal. Yeah. I, yeah, could you be more specific about the question? I'm yeah. Absolutely not. Only the clients might be able to work miracles. I think that's based on evidence. <laughs> Everybody's got biases, and biases about everything. Um, you know. I think don't know of any way to avoid those, um, or any way, or even any reason to want to avoid them. I don't see any reason to avoid having biases, or so I'm not clear about how to answer your are question. Are you making? Uh, it sounds like. Are you talking about uh, assumptions we hold, and you call it biases? I'm not sure. Assumptions you're talking. Is that what we're talking about? One half of the question? Okay, what's the other half of the question? Expectations? Of what? Of myself or of the client? Of a therapist. Therapist I'm training or therapist uh, as a therapist of myself? Oh, I certainly mm, would. I would. I certainly would make a distinction. Mm. The people that I'm training or, or teaching, I have a different, I mean, you know, certain expectations of them. As a therapist, I have certain expectations of, uh, of myself. Okay. Yes. All right. That would be Please helpful. I think you're talking about assumptions. Okay. The, uh, the, the therapist, we certainly have some assumptions that we hold, work out of. Um, and uh, one of the assumptions is that instead of looking at change as very difficult to achieve, that's the assumptions that almost all therapeutic models hold, is that the, the change is very difficult to accomplish. Uh, we hold that, um, that, there are, that change is inevitable. And constant. It's constantly occurring. It's just that people don't look at it, don't see it. So we have to help point it out. So, They're changing. You can't stop it. You cannot not change. And you cannot not have an effect on the process. So I think that un unlike this, uh, the notion that we are separated from the, the uh, entity that we are observing, we become part of that. So we have to become a uh, participant observer. So I cannot not participate. Just by asking questions, I'm intruding in there whatever is going on between the client and I. That's their therapeutic system. And so I do have an influence. I cannot not have an influence just by asking questions. And that's why you have to find here? out what the client wants. You know, just by asking. So you know which direction to influence things. Think about it. The simplest question, how old are you? Given the context of why the clients come to see us, Given the context of this relationship, professional relationship, the client assumes that how old he or she is has something to do with why he or she's here. Otherwise, he wouldn't ask. <laughs> okay, please do. I wish you, you would be more direct. Yeah. My expectation is they will be successful. Oh, that's a hell of a big difference. No, oh, yeah. Automatically. Yeah, that's quite, okay. They, they do have 
the ability to know. They don't think they know when they come into the door. Otherwise, they wouldn't come. Right? They don't know. They know. Yeah. Hopefully, that's our that's our outcome. So to speak. Some. Some. Yes. Some, yes. some clients. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Oh, oh, I didn't hear that. Uh, I'm looking at this as a question you'll ask one individual. When I have a family, when you have a family and a couple, do you yeah. ask each person each of these questions, or how do you do that when it's more than one human being in a room? Um, this is where Steve Both. and I, uh, <laughs> Steve and I, this is, uh, our style is very different. I would start out with, let's say you come in as a couple or a husband and wife, and uh, you would say, well, she will start bitching. She will start bitching. Okay? Um, that's your answer to, you know, suppose a miracle happened or something. You don't need to come back. She will start bitching. And, what, right. and I say, what will she do instead? What will she do instead of bitching? And, well, she will talk nice. All right. So suppose she talks nice. And then I go into more details about what do you mean talk nice? What will she do when she talks nice? So lots of details about talk nice. Okay. And then, so suppose she was soft-spoken, she used different words, and she looked at you in the eyes. Suppose she does that. What will you do that you didn't do this? You know, same thing. What will you do? Or, or I would say, when you do that, when you talk to him, look at him, uh, talk to him nice, use, use different words, what would he do different that he didn't do today? So, uh, so weaving together of two different solution pictures. Okay. I'm more uh, likely to uh, just go down sort of each person's list before I start talking about back and forth. Because um, yeah, I want to keep them, I, I find it easier to keep focused that way for, for myself. Um, but I will also do the other, a, you know, so there's no set rule. Um, there's no, yeah, there's no set rules about these things. I noticed you were next. Yeah, yeah you. Yeah. Um, I will not look at it as a failure, first of all. Uh, I will be very curious about how he stopped his violent behavior when he did. And this is only an hour later. So how come it wasn't a three-hour or four-hour long episode of violence? And what was different about this episode compared to other, other violent episodes he has had in the past? What was different about it? Assuming that there was some difference. Always assume make that assumption. There okay. must even have been some was, difference. Even if it was 10 seconds shorter than previous episode, I would want to know how he managed to stop when it did. Why did it only go for an hour and 15 minutes and not go hour and 16 minutes? Yeah. Okay. Right. 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 They usually say it's because so and so stopped me. So and so took away my knife, or so and so held my hand, or something like that. Then I, I really don't buy that because lots of times the drug addicts will tell me I ran out of money. That's why I, I don't, I didn't use, uh, I didn't continue to use drugs all night because I ran out of money. I say, well, if you really wanted. 
if you really wanted drugs, there are other ways you could have gotten it. If you really wanted to, to uh, continue to be violent, you could have kicked somebody with your feet instead of using your arms. If somebody held your arm, there mm -hmm. are other ways you could have continued to be uh, violent. How come you didn't? What went How into come? that decision? Okay. And all of a sudden, well, what decision? Yeah. Huh? And. Well, again, even if he was restrained physically, the whole body was, you know, held down. I don't know how it's, yeah. I've seen this done with seven-year-old boy, like a five yeah. adults held the body, you know, the boy He's down still, on the floor. He's still carrying on. Um, but he could have also uh, continued to be abusive, violent with his mouth. You still bite? But how come he chose not to bite? Somehow he stopped. I'm emphasizing his having stopped, having enough control to stop himself. Something, somewhere. Why that time? And not, how did you manage not to go on? How did you manage how did you to, stop after 23 to stop after 23? How did you manage to stop after 23 and not go on to number 24? Questions like that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm, clients can do that. In they seem experience. to do it. They seem to be shocked by this question. They think it's a pretty strange a... idea that they were able to go an hour and 15 and not an hour and 16. They're pretty surprised by that idea. Because nobody has asked them. Why didn't you go on to hour and 16 minutes? It's always, my God, why are you going on like this for hour and 15 minutes? Everybody is asking that direction. They, nobody yeah. has asked the other side of it. How did you stop after an hour and 15? I don't understand this. Well, immediate answer is I don't know. I don't know. And I'm very really? I'm very persistent with that. I don't give up. Okay, let me back up. Let me back up one step. I'm not sure this this kid is a client. What does this kid want from you? Okay, so this doesn't doesn't look like it's worked very well. What you just did that ended you up back here under restraints. That doesn't look like it worked very well. And getting somebody off your back. What are you going to do different next time? I'm going to go that way. You have to keep in mind, what is it the client wants? Okay. Yeah. I have a question I just want to ask. The basic question is then, what you just said is very clear. And that was, how do you know you have the right question, the right problem? And if you think right. you don't, what do you leave the client with that you want to check? Do you leave them with the number of questions or what? <coughs> Um, there are situations uh, that during the first meeting you have no idea what client wants, you have no idea uh, what, uh, what they can do, what they, what, uh, who, is the, who is the real client, really. 
you have no idea what the hell is going on, basically. Right. There are sessions. There are sessions like that. And then I think that I might leave the session was this has this meeting has been very helpful. Uh, but I would like you to think about what is it that has to happen so that we don't we can stop meeting like this. Especially, I think, the clients who don't want to meet with you. That's their goal anyway. So that might be the kind of question that I would leave the client with. So if they say, what do you mean meeting like this? Would you say anything? You don't want to be here, right? And you say, yeah, you're, you're, you're damn right. You don't want to be here, right? <laughs> but you got to be here. But you got to be here. So PO says so, right? Oh, okay. okay. I wanted to be here and I thought I knew the problem. Turns out. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, I, I guess that uh, if what the client wants is not clear, um, and, or it's a very uh, poor way to say this. Um, yeah, if you have, are unable to generate in your head a videotape of what the client wants, um, then the best thing probably to do is just give them compliments at the end of the session. And don't try and give them a task, because you don't understand the situation well enough to give them a task. And just give, give them a bunch of compliments about what a nice job they did of describing what it is and um, you know they're in the right place at the right time and all that, and we'll see you next week. Um, so we have a saying about, you know, if you don't know what to do, then the best thing is nothing. Well, I actually thought I knew what to do, and you did something, and it turned out it wasn't the question. Oh. Well, then, you, then I, we have a, I see. So you did something, and it turned out that it wasn't, uh, didn't do it the job. Um, what I do at that point is I would apologize for having understood. And I would probably make sure that, at least in that session, I don't give another homework assignment. How can I check to make sure that I know what's wrong? So I went on for something that I didn't really know. I just got to know. Mm. Well, you don't need to know. Yeah, you don't need to know is. what the problem is. I don't, I don't need to know what the problem is. All you need to know is what the client wants. What does the client want? Yeah, I think that's crucial piece, is what does a client want? You have to know what a client wants. So if that's the only way you're going to be able to terminate. Right. Yeah. yeah. So I worked with that, I thought. Yeah, right. well, then you did the best you could. Yeah. And if it doesn't help, then you apologize for having misunderstood. Um, we have so many I'm hands. not the yes. only one. Yes. I do that all the time. Oh, <laughs> I'm very good at here, apologizing. Here, here, here. Here, here? Okay. Oh, okay. All right. Well, that's a perfectly that's, reasonable thing to yeah, buy. Yeah, I think that that's reasonable. Uh, you want your life to be, yeah, right. You want to be a life to be pure. So if if they can't get everything they want every day, they are miserable. Well, I think that if you get that kind of answers at the end of the session, the client wants a perfect life and uh, without uh, lifting the finger, uh, right? I mean, I don't have to do anything and having mm -hmm. a perfect life. Right. Something went terribly wrong in your interview <laughs> with a mm -hmm. client. Uh, something terribly wrong with that. I mean, when you know something wrong with that. My metaphor for that is um, just because this model is very much client-driven. Uh, we are not. Um, we're not wait waitresses. I, I'm not a waitress. Just because a client comes and says, you know, I want uh, 
a tuna salad sandwich, and then you say, do you want this on whole wheat bread, or do you want this on, uh, you know, I mean, uh, white bread, or toasted, or whatever, and do you want uh, mustard on it, or do you want, uh, uh, you know, coleslaw to go with it, or do you want french fry to go with it, and, and then at the end of the session, I said, okay, I'll, here is your sandwich, you know, I mean, uh, it's all a matter of negotiating, but you're always working with each other, uh, negotiating, so that's what we call it, uh, negotiating for well-formed goals. It's a well-formed goals. And you need to have, break have it down have, somehow uh, the small steps. Yeah, so what does a client want? Essentially, it's not something that we take orders from the client. Uh, it's a negotiated. It's got to be something that's possible. So if you get that kind of an answer, I, well, if someone says, you know, I want to be, I want to be, to be married to a millionaire, and I don't ever have to work again in my life. Some no, that sounds like that. I, that sounds like a great idea. I'd like the same thing. <laughs> and then I stop. No, I mean, I, 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 seriously, and then I stop right there. And then I've had it happen more than once. After a long enough pause, the client will say, "Oh, you mean something that could really happen." They'll do it all by themselves. Just right. go with it. Yeah, of course you no, want the I would say, no, five I would say Mercedes. Maybe for any say, reasonable person does. <laughs> I would say, really? <laughs> really? You want to marry a millionaire? Where are you going to find them? <laughs> that was the end of the story. So it's sort of dismissed. I think a many different ways to dismiss the clients. Where are you uh, going to meet this millionaire? Unrealistic, uh, you know, pipe dreams. That's a pipe dream. Yeah. Right. Oh. oh, we the, well don't uh, for, uh, to, uh, wouldn't let that be a problem. If I were you, it's not a problem. It's not a problem. Don't make it a problem. Um, yeah, because we, we frequently won't even ask. Um, our second sessions start with this question: So, what is better since last time you were here? And whatever they say is better, and how? What they did to make it better, that's having done the, t the task. Whatever it is. They, you know, they, they will spontaneously be, tell you so. If They will spontaneously tell you what they thought was the task you told them to do. I think the, the, the mistake is in putting too much emphasis on the task as the solution. Okay. The task is just a task tap on the just shoulder. An idea. It's just an idea we're proposing, throwing out to them. Task is not necessarily the solution. Because we have found the clients are a lot more creative than we could ever possibly be. There's no way that I'm going to be creative with every one of my clients. But they are very creative about their own situation. And uh, so task is generally uh, keep to keep, uh, uh, keep track of what goes well between now and next time, that kind of a stuff, okay? That's the most common kind of a tech we give is uh, pay attention to what your daughter does that seems to work for her, something like that, or, uh, you know, that kind of a generally, it's not, whenever your task is stopping a problem, it doesn't work as well. But the task is, so it's like a, instead of a moving away from problem, we help the clients to move toward the solutions. Get them to start a solution. The, the task is centered around, the general principle of that is how to get the client get started at something that is helpful rather than stopping something that's not helpful. Okay. So it's really, uh, you know, uh, it's not a problem for us if the client doesn't do it. Yeah. But they may have done something other than what we have suggested. They and that's normally okay do. with us too, as they, long as it works. They normally do. They sort of modify and adapt to their, to what they, whatever they do anyway. So why not go with it, and uh, work with it? Okay. So again, well, the task is usually it should not be stopping something from happening. No, it should. That won't work. Yeah. With a client? Yeah. 
I don't think that's ever happened to me. Uh, that's not true. There are some t sessions we have said we cannot help you. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, but. I think that. Is that what you mean? I'm not sure what you mean. <laughs> oh, oh. Oh. I guess that I would, um, oh, yeah, that, well, the reason I say I don't have that happen is that the client may come back and say it's not working. And, that, you know, I said, well, you know, I don't know what else to do, so let's quit. I, I can't think of anything. Um, when I can't relate to that question. Um, you know, because the judge of whether it's working or not is the client's job, not mine. I, so I, I can't relate to the question. Uh, if what? And well, yeah, well, I'm not sure they're clients. Okay, I, I'm not sure they're clients. Um, um, I can't, yeah, I don't see that happening. Um, uh, I think there's a distinction between, that Jay Haley makes a distinction between doing therapy and social control. I think they're two different things. Maybe that's where this comes from. No. Never. Never. No need for that. No need for that. Well, we have a word yeah, sure. uh, called the hidden customer. Well, uh, we believe that all clients are hidden customers. Mm. The customers for something, it's just something. you don't know what. They want something from coming to see you. We don't know sometimes. Why would they be in your office? What would they, they come to your office for? Oh, yeah. well. But then. Why, why, so why did he let, let them send him? But he wants something, oh, though. He wants something, otherwise he wouldn't show up. Even if he wants a bus, bus ticket from you, he wants something, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, one, one last question, that's okay. it. Yeah, we have to stop. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. no. uh, can we? Uh, Why are you lucky? Yeah. Can we? <laughs> can we hold that until this afternoon when we come back and we can talk about that? Okay. All right. Okay. Well, have a nice lunch.